Hi again. In Kenneth Scott Latourette's A History of Christianity, we've reached chapter 8, The Rise of Monasticism. What is the perfect Christian life? Can it be lived? If so, how? Does it entail the transformation of all human society? Can individuals be immersed in a prevailingly or partially unchristian society without compromising their principles and be fully Christian? To be fully Christian, is it necessary to, do, to withdraw from society? If so, must one live alone, or must those intent on the complete Christian life seek it in community with others? If life in community is necessary, can there be a community, a human society, which will fully embody the Christian ideal? In one, one form or another, these questions have been raised by Christians from the outset and have been recurrent across the centuries. Beginning in the third century, they became insistent, and in the following two centuries were increasingly clement or noisy. As we have seen, the early Christians were a small minority of the population of the Roman Empire and to a large degree held aloof from the society about them, seeking to realize the ideal in the small communities which then made up the church. By the middle of the third century, thousands were pouring into the church. The great persecutions of the second half of the third century and the first quarter of the fourth century only temporarily checked the flood, and by their failure eventually accelerated it. Before the close of the fifth century, the overwhelming majority of the citizens of the Roman Empire were professing themselves to be Christians, had been baptized, and were members of one or another of the bodies which bore the Christian name. As we saw at the end of the last chapter, with the progress of the mass conversion, the discipline of the church was being relaxed, and the gap between the ideal and the performance of the average Christian widened. It was partially as a reaction against this laxity, and partly because of the dissatisfaction which the teachings of Jesus and the apostles aroused with anything short of perfection, that monasticism arose. At first it was primarily a lay movement, not within the hierarchical structure of the clergy. To some degree, it was a rebellion of the individual against the organization of the Catholic Church, regimented as that was under the bishops and clergy. Indeed, at times, its members were quite unsubmissive to the bishops and were insubordinate, even tumultuously so, against a particular bishop. Many bishops looked with unfriendly eyes on the monks. In the initial decades of monasticism, numbers of monks, laymen living alone, seldom partook of the Eucharist. Yet by the end of the 5th century, monasticism had spread so widely that it had become characteristic of the Catholic Church. It was being regarded as the preferred way towards the perfect Christian life, and as such it was attracting many of the most ardent Christian youth. Henceforward, it was to be an accepted feature of the Catholic Church and of most of the churches into which that church divided. At present, while rejected by most of Protestantism, it is found in the churches which embrace a majority of those who regard themselves as Christians. It so captured the churches that in the East, eventually, the bishops were normally, indeed, almost if not quite universally, drawn from the mon monasteries. In the West, many of the bishops were monks. Before the end of the 6th century, Pope Gregory I, one of the strongest men to sit on the throne of Peter, was drawn, reluctant, from his monastery, although it is not certain that he ever took monastic vows, and since then many monks have been numbered among his successors. Monasticism has displayed many variations and has been one of the chief ways in which the vitality of the Christian faith has, has found expression. We are, accordingly, not only to trace its beginnings, but in later chapters we are again and again to recur to it, to sketch its successive stages. It must be pointed out here that Latteret himself is a Protestant, so he's not got a prejudice towards monasticism. He, in fact, if, if anything, he's prejudiced against it, but he's willing to grant its many advantages over the centuries, its contributions to the growth of uh, of the the world of the Renaissance and the Reformation and the universities, of course. More about that later. To a certain degree, monasticism represented the triumph of ideas which the Catholic Church had denounced as heretical. Into it crept something of the legalism, the belief that salvation can be earned and deserved, which is opposed to grace and which had been 
theoretically rejected when the Ebionites, that is the, the Jewish Christians, were appraised as untrue to the gospel. In it was still more of the conviction that flesh and matter are evil, which had been so prominent in Gnosticism, the Marcionites, and Manichaeism. In the triumph of monasticism, therefore, basic attitudes and beliefs won acceptance, which in other forms the Catholic Church had branded as contrary to the genius of the Christian faith. Moreover, at its inception, and to some degree in its later history, monasticism had much in it which was in contrast with the gospel. At the outset, for the most part, it was not missionary, in the sense that it did not endeavor to win non-Christians. It did not seek to save the world, but to flee from it. The primary objective of the monk was his own salvation, not that of others. We must also note that, again, in opposition to what is found in the New Testament, where all Christians are called upon to be saints and a holy priesthood, Monasticism tended to divide Christians into two groups, those aspiring to perfection and those content to compromise with sub-Christian or non-Christian practices. Yet, distinctively Christian elements were in the monastic movement. On renouncing their possessions, the aspirants to the monastic life distributed them among the poor. Hundreds of monks, including the most famous of the pioneers, gave spiritual counsel to those who came to them. In later centuries, especially in the West, many monastic organizations became missionary or devoted themselves to the service of others. Indeed, from the 6th century onward, most of the missionaries of the Roman Catholic and Eastern churches were men and women who had taken monastic vows. Next time, Latteret deals with pre-monastic Christian asceticism. I'll put in a link to a video we did on the Gnostic heresy, by the way, and how it infiltrates some of the teachings and emphases of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. So the Gnostic heresy in three aspects, and those three aspects are an anointed elite, a non-physical resurrection, and a new light gospel, based on the epistle of John, the first epistle of John, chapter 2. See you soon.